Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to cover a bit of a heavy topic and that's what to do if your child is arrested. Now I'm going to start off with an assumption here and it might seem like I'm being a little silly but I'm assuming that you love your child, that you want to see them happy and healthy and prosperous and all of that good stuff because really that's what's at stake. We're trying to do everything we can to preserve your child's future. The criminal justice system has a real way of closing a lot of doors and sending people down dark paths. So that's what we're trying to avoid here. The first thing I'll talk about is that when and if this call comes in, this might be something that you were expecting because you might have seen that your child was on a sort of darker path and you know that you were concerned that this call might come or it might be completely unexpected sometimes i hear parents say i don't need to worry about this my kid is such an angel they would never get into any trouble and you never you can never say never on this one because sometimes kids do something stupid even really good kids sometimes do something stupid Sometimes people get falsely accused of things. That's also a possibility. And another thing that comes up all the time is just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, your child is walking home from school and some friends of theirs who they know uh, pull up in a car and say, hey, uh, we'll give you a ride, hop in. And your child thinks, okay, yeah, these are, you know, these are acquaintances at school. They don't seem like bad kids but then the car gets pulled over and it turns out one of them has a gun and everyone in that car is going to get charged including your kid even though they didn't have anything to do with it so there's all sorts of these possibilities here and you can never discount the chance that this can happen when this call comes in you're likely to experience a whole range of different emotions you're probably going to be pissed off and sad and upset and you know all of these different things at once and it's really important that you do your best to control all of that you may have an urge to yell at your kid and you know to start telling them listen when you get home there's gonna be some hell to pay this is not the time you can save that for later when your child is not um, in custody because your child is going to be experiencing a similar range of emotions although probably slanted more towards things like fear and, you know, regret and so forth. It's really important that they be able to rely on you as a source of stability and not a further source of chaos and disruption. The next thing I'm going to say is you're going to want to get a lawyer involved early in this process, uh, as soon as you know that something is going on. That lawyer, of course, is going to be more detached than you, so they're going to be better in control of that whole emotional state. And they also know what they're doing. They will have dealt with this before. You're going to want to hire somebody from your local jurisdiction who knows the local practices, and they can give you specific legal advice for your specific situation. You know, this is just a YouTube video with some general principles. It's not to be taken as legal advice. You need somebody who can actually advise you and take those steps. And if the lawyer tells you something that is different than what I'm saying in this video, do what they say, because they're the ones helping you out in your particular circumstances. You'll also have an opportunity to talk to your child and you should let them know that they have, you know, they've got a right to have you present in the interview and also to have a lawyer present. This is different from the rights that you enjoy as an adult, and I say enjoy because you actually, as an adult, have less rights in terms of the police interview process than a youth under the age of 18 does. Uh, you, as an adult, you're not permitted, or usually, to have your lawyer physically present in the police interview, but a child is, and they should absolutely seek they should absolutely be trying to insist on that uh, because that will help preserve their legal rights. And again, you know, talk to a lawyer. If the lawyer says different than I do, go with what they say. But I think it would be you'd be hard pressed to find a lawyer who said, yeah, no, they should just go in on their own and, you know, and wing it. So the next thing I'll mention is 
you shouldn't assume that your child has done it just because the police say so. The police get things wrong all the time. And so we have a presumption of innocence in our legal system that doesn't necessarily apply to your interactions with your child, but you shouldn't assume that they did it. And, but by the same token, you shouldn't necessarily assume that they didn't. It's at this stage, you just don't know. I'll also mention that the lawyer you hire for your child represents your child and not you. And if your interests differ, if you have, you know, they'll go with what your child's interests are instead of yours. That can be a very difficult thing for parents to swallow, especially because you may want to know, for instance, what your child told the lawyer. And the lawyer's not going to be able to tell you, usually. So trust what the lawyer is doing. They're doing it for good reasons. Um, sometimes there are situations where a child might have a very good uh, excuse or defense, but it's something they don't want to tell you. It might be something embarrassing. It might be something that you would disapprove of. Be aware, you know, it's really important, even if you're paying the bills, that lawyer represents your child instead of you. The police are probably going to try to convince you that you should be, you know, with them. They're going to tell you that they're on your side and that they're, you know, just looking out for what's best for the kid. And often what I see is the police managing to convince the parents to be present in the interview where both the police and the parents are telling the child to confess. This is a terrible dynamic. You have to remember that all of those things that we talked about earlier, about how you care about your child being happy and healthy and prosperous. Those aren't objectives for the police. What the police want is to conclude the file with an arrest and a charge. And, you know, they're less concerned, if at all, about whether your child, it, you know, ends up being a successful and um, healthy member of society, or if they spend the rest of their life in and out of jails. It's... You know, your child's interest at this point, you have to be on your child's side 100% because the police are not. So if they're trying to convince you that you're on the same team, you are not on the same team as the police if those are your interests. Some parents will tell me that they have, uh, that they want to see their child uh, spend some time in custody because they're like, I want to put some fear into this kid, you know, uh, I think it would be good for them. We'll scare them straight. And this is a terrible idea. And part of this gets down to brain chemistry. Your brain has a little section uh, that helps manage fear, but you're only, it, it can only do so much work. It can only keep you afraid for so long. Whatever situation you're in eventually becomes your normal. This becomes a big deal if you're sending your kid off to, you know, some sort of detention facility because initially at their arrest, they're terrified. They're scared shitless, but that's going to go away. And, you know, pretty soon they're getting used to it and they're thinking, you know, I was terrified, but now this doesn't feel so bad. And in not too long, they're making friends in there and those friends will pull your child in directions you don't want them going. You know, this is the worst kinds of friendships. The last thing you want is for your kid to be talking to a whole bunch of really committed young criminals and saying, hey, um, look me up on Facebook when you get out. You know, we'll go, we'll hang out. They'll introduce your child to all sorts of new things. And this is how you get on that those bad paths that I was talking about. Uh, be mindful as well that uh, any small admissions can be very dangerous when, you know, when there's some sort of police interview. Uh, anything that you might want to volunteer to the police could potentially be used against your child in ways that uh, can cause them all sorts of problems. Uh, a lot of people think that there's not really big stakes involved when you're talking about youths because they say, hey, listen, as soon as the kid turns 18, 
uh, that record will be closed off and, you know, nothing to worry about. That's not necessarily the case. There are various ways, and I don't want to go into everything here because this is a conversation to have with your lawyer in this circumstance later, but there's various ways that a youth record can end up on an adult record. And there's various ways that a youth record can interfere with your life and disrupt it. So this is not uh, this is not consequence free. This is in fact you're playing with uh, with real risk here. Consider as well the possibility that a bail condition. Uh, so your child is released, but with conditions that prevent them from going to school or prevent them from attending the school that they were at. Uh, that's going to really mess up your child's trajectory and can really interfere with the possibilities of future success. So it's really important in these circumstances that you take things uh, very seriously. I also recommend that parents, uh, when your kid is getting to the age where they might potentially have police involvement, and that starts at age 12, because at age 12 is when you start being uh, potentially liable for criminal offenses, um, that you might want to have a talk with your with your child about how to deal with the police and the importance of not making statements to the police. This is something that uh, gets people in a lot of trouble is, you know, they feel inclined to talk to the police. It's never a good idea or, you know, to the extent that there's various uh, Supreme Court decisions that have basically said that, uh, you know, one of the most important purposes of the lawyer call when you is that the lawyer is going to most likely advise you not to talk. So being prepared in advance for, you know, for those situations is also um, helpful. Uh, talk to your kids, uh, both about, you know, staying away from things that could get them into trouble, but also about, you know, appropriate steps for dealing with the police. And again, that is making sure that they phone you, uh, making sure that they, you know, get in touch with a lawyer and also making sure that they are aware that it's a bad idea, unless their lawyer says otherwise, to make a statement to the police. All right, so those are some uh, some general principles. Um, as noted, uh, get a lawyer involved. Make sure that they, you know, make sure you listen to them. But uh, I hope this ends up helping somebody because I see a lot of circumstances that I think are really tragic where... Uh, especially where the parents have been uh, kind of roped into the side of the police and end up realizing uh, a little too late that they really regret the role that they played in it. Um, that's a tough thing for a parent. So anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you found this to be interesting and educational. Um, it's a really tough thing for parents to think about is this possibility, but uh, it happens. And, you know, just because your child has had some police involvement doesn't mean it's the end of all of those um, hopeful futures that we have for, for our children. So anyway, uh, hopefully you found this to be useful. Uh, please like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to see more content. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Canada's National Firearms Association, the CCFR, the Canadian Shooting Sports Association, at the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited and Mark Levier Demour, and at the $20 level, Peter Hilger, Mark, Jane Babe and Luxor, Haywire, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Bruno R., Andrew Elsich, and Rick J.D. Thank you as well to my $10 supporters who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge.